Wait, remember Gargoyles? It was Walt Disney animation series that centered around a gang of living, breathing, philosophizing gargoyles. Stone decor by day, living, breathing gargoyles by night. Once active in medieval Scotland, a group of gargoyles is reawakened in modern day, or at least the modern day of the 90s, New York City. Originally having no names other than the leader Goliath, the gargoyles choose names based off of well-known geographical features of New York, like neighborhoods, streets, boroughs, or rivers. This is how we end up with Brooklyn, Bronx, Hudson, Broadway, and Lexington, with their loyal ally and Goliath's love interest, Elisa, who is a detective with the NYPD. Together they fly about the city at night, both keeping people safe when they can and dealing with their new semi-hidden lives in a judgmental society. Greg Wiseman, also known for creating the spectacular Spider-Man and Young Justice, among a myriad of other cool things, is the creator of Gargoyles. One of the main inspirations for the show was a Disney show called Adventures of the Gummy Bears. That show is about a group of bears that are the last of their gummy race. Much like gargoyles, they crave a future in which these kind-hearted, gentle bears can live beside and thrive with humans. Wiseman wanted to capture the same rich mythology and backstory with a medieval setting to mirror the mythological part, but he wanted it to be edgier, more respectable. Are you telling me that these bears of the gummy variety don't bring enough edge? <laughs> All right, man, whatever. Weissman had always had a fascination with gargoyles in his high school days, so he decided it would be fun to make the monsters be the good guys, changing the perception of them looking scary or evil and really just being big, lovable creatures of the night. Since its premiere on October 24th, 1994, it's accrued a large community base of dedicated fans, and the show itself is regarded as one of the best superhero-esque animations of its time. Due to its deep storylines and complex interpersonal or inter-gargoyle dynamics, Dynamics. So, tis the season, let's take a look into the show that as a kid I can never watch past sundown. Is it too late to go and talk about the gummy bears instead? He wants to dominate us. In medieval Scotland, a group of gargoyles protects Wyvern Castle, but after being lured away from his post one fateful night, and he and the rest of the clan are blamed for the castle being overrun, and also in a misunderstanding regarding the well-being of the princess, the royal mage curses the gargoyles to turn to stone, only to be reawoken 1,000 years later, aided by ex-Wyvern clan member Demona. For a lot of the series, our main villain of the story is David Xanatos, who plays a Lex Luthor kind of figure. He's a billionaire member of the Illuminati who purchases and moves Wyvern Castle into Manhattan, believing that if he owns the gargoyles, that they will be loyal to him in furthering himself as a selfish and power-hungry individual. No, like, they literally put the castle on a skyscraper. How does, how do you even, how does that work? Goliath is the leader of the group, once known as the Wyvern Clan, now dubbed the Manhattan Clan. He shoulders most of the responsibility for his clan and has all the qualifications of a good leader. Well, minus a short temper. His strong moral compass often leads him to delegating and playing ambassador to the humans often. But when he does have to fight enemies, he does so very, very well, and he is not easy to take down. He's actually shown in season one, episode 10, to be reading Dostoevsky. And although it doesn't say which of his works it is, he is known for his writings on existentialism, psychology, and modernism. He seems to have an inherent interest in the intellectual side of humanity, showing that he's a multi dimensional being challenging the initial judgments of what a gargoyle is. And speaking of philosophy, the show touches on a new moral dilemma virtually every episode. The show does not shy away from discussing, learning from, and blatantly showing the audience more important and impactful themes, whether it is on an episode-to-episode -episode basis or over small story arcs. The group faces prejudice on all sides and is constantly being pulled in different radical directions. Goliath's strong moral code and loyal family both allow the team to stay on track with what they truly believe is right and just. In his case, he believes that he can achieve a world where people and gargoyles coexist. In the end, they strive to better their community and help the people around them in whatever way they can. But while they do that, they must also protect themselves from outside harm. I, I have some things to attend to elsewhere. We will return with more gargoyles. We now return.
Elisa is one of the first humans the group meets. During a pretty illegal search of one of the main villains Xanato's lair, she stumbles into the Wyvern Castle, which has been relocated on top of the evil villainous tower. Like I said, how to get up there? That's how. But either way, it's it's sick. It's dope. I like it. The gothic side and emo phase of me is seeping back out just looking at it. There, she runs into Goliath and accidentally falls over the edge of the castle in her fright. Goliath saves her and because of this, they begin to talk and have a conversation, leading to her understanding that despite their monstrous appearance, that they have humanity and are no different than herself. They quickly bond with her and she becomes their human liaison, or window into the human world. Over time, she and Goliath fall in love, despite their physical differences. This causes a lot of jealous attacks from Goliath's ex-lover, our favorite immortal problematic winged beauty, Demona. Demona poses some more interesting ethical dilemmas in the series. She bounced back and forth from hero to villain a lot and her descent into villainry is understandable, garnering a lot of sympathy. She harbors a lot of hatred and loneliness in her heart which makes her actions very emotionally charged. In combination with that, her power-hungry personality allows her to put herself first above anyone else. As a coping mechanism for a lot of her trauma, she never seems to take responsibility for her actions and overcompensates a lot of her insecurities by establishing her superiority. The rest of the founding group members are Lexington, Brooklyn, Broadway, Hudson, and Bronx. Lexington is a very intelligent and science-savvy tech bro who likes to experiment with modern technology and machinery. Despite his intelligence, he has proved to be naive in the beginning of the series. Brooklyn initially is the reckless and easy-to-anger member of the group, but he's also curious in nature, with a cynical sense of humor. He offers a mix of a fun character that also has a moodier side to him. Brooklyn does have one of the more severe character evolutions in the series, and him becoming Goliath's second-in-command. Broadway is the sweetheart of the group. He is very positive and sports a childish sense of wonder for all the new things modern New York has to offer. He's very passionate about good food, good entertainment, and his open-minded nature allows him to be the focus of many of the show's episodes that touch on insightful and complex topics. Hudson is Goliath's mentor and Broadway's biological father, which neither of them are aware of. You are the father! <laughs> He is the past leader of the Wyvern clan, and both him and Goliath have a mutual respect that allows him to step down as a leader, and help Goliath in his position with wisdom whenever it is needed. Serving as a classical grandfather-esque figure, he is very averse to modern technologies and ways of living. The last founding member of the Manhattan clan is Bronx, who takes on the role of the family dog, as a kind of gargoyle-like animal. He is a strong fighter, and he's incredibly loyal to his pack. Although he can't talk, he is still regarded as an important founding member of the Manhattan clan, and I just love that. The show received lots of attention for their crew of voice actors, majority of which had also been prominent somewhere in the Star Trek media franchise. But this is a Gargoyles video, and not a Star Trek one. With a cast that individually shine as their roles, the show's conversations and dialogue hit the respective tones that flesh out who these characters are. Marina Sirtis, Jonathan Frakes, Sally Richardson Whitfield, Frank Welker, Bill Fagerbaki, Jeff Bennett, Edward Asner, Tom Adcox Hernandez, Keith David, and a massive list of other amazing voice actors all do their best to blend this, frankly, darker Disney show with rich characters that have interconnected storylines. It all comes together very nicely, so to have this aspect of the show mix so well with the way it all looks is impressive. Gargoyles is known very well for its dark and brooding tone, as well as color palette and art style that heavily align with the gothic themes. The Shakespearean references and inspiration is very overt and equally appropriate given that he would have been alive in the late 16th century, towards the tail end of the European gothic style. It even goes as far as to have a villain named Macbeth at one point, so they're really not trying to hide it, are they? And if they were trying to hide it, it'd look like this. Inspired by classic Greek tragedies and in addition to his comedic works, Shakespeare also is known for writing lots of tragedies with heavy drama, high stakes, and droning monologues about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, which tend to tip over the line into philosophical and ethical musings on many occasions. The brooding darkness behind the tragic play falls nicely into the gothic style. We see a perfect example of this right off the bat when Goliath decides to follow his gargoyle family into a stony death. Well, uh, I guess a kind of death. Like, okay, Romeo, do what you gotta do, I guess. It's time. 
No, that's the wrong Romeo. But seriously, this was like the go-to move in Greek tragedies and also in Shakespeare's tragic works as well. And it's not the last time this trope is explored. Gothic literature, also appropriately dubbed Gothic horror, is intimately associated with the architectural Gothic revival style that was popularized in the mid-1700s. Truly a goth girl era, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre are great examples of the Gothic literature and melodramatic style of the time. And of course, Victor Hugo gets an honorary mention for his novel, The Humpback of Notre Dame. Wait, did I, did I just say humpback? <laughs> The Hunchback of Notre Dame, closely associated with the horror genre with human nature and ethical questions were posed in the form of monsters and physical manifestations. Setting stories like these in gothic structures does a few things for the audience in all of the aforementioned works. That includes gargoyles. It inspires a sense of awe in the subliminal ornateness of the architecture, and also dates these stories, heavily connecting them to the feeling of isolation in the past. In gargoyles, the style serves as a reminder of when when they originally lived, especially when you juxtapose it with the metallic, minimalist buildings that surround Wyvern Castle. The gargoyles are not only lonely in their unfamiliarity with the new times, but also with the people. Where'd they go? Gargoyles will return. We now return to gargoyles. Gargoyles as an architectural concept were introduced and utilized in the Gothic style from around the 13th century. They were implemented as a gutter system to regulate water flow on spires, walls, and flying buttresses. They took the form of a winged dragon-like creature that originated from an ancient French tale of a sea serpent named Gargoyle, which translated to throat, that resided in the River Seine, which ran through prominent towns of France like Paris, Notre Dame, and Rouen, home of the Rouen Cathedral. Tying back into the idea of a water disposal system, the root is also found in English words today like gurgle or gullet. Like I mentioned earlier with gargoyle's translation meaning throat, they were created so that they could have a practical water disposal system that was equally as ornate as the rest of the intricate cathedrals that they adorned. In Paris, it was a common understanding that the gargoyles would take flight after sunset to fly around the city protecting Paris's many cafes. Sound like some of the other gargoyles we know? The concept of these gargoyles being an architectural addition to a castle no less in the year 994 AD in medieval Scotland is not historically accurate in the least. But then again, you know what's also not historically accurate? Magical stone creatures that come alive at night, so I won't be too picky about it. It's magic stuff, so I'll suspend my disbelief so I can just enjoy the series. Gargoyles uses classic literary devices to enrich the drama behind the story being told, making the characters more three-dimensional and the story more engaging. Its darkened and noir-esque color palette has in the past been compared to other 90s cartoons, like the 90s iteration of Batman cartoons or even Batman Beyond. It has a specific gray, contrast-heavy palette with simple 2D animation that is both beautiful and detailed with a grainy texture. But despite its very beautiful animation and interesting characterization, the show was never renewed for any more content after its third season titled Gargoyles, The Goliath Chronicles, which both fans and Wiseman himself don't consider to be canon, due to Wiseman being replaced as a producer. He was left on only as a consultant for that series, and he didn't particularly like that third season at all. He expressed his frustrations in an interview at how they weren't taking his suggestions, and sometimes they would do the exact opposite of what he told them to do, or what he told them not to do. And fans were equally as frustrated with how the season turned out, quality-wise. Wiseman suggests that it's more of an alternate universe more than anything. All in all, the series had 78 episodes in its three seasons combined. Wiseman is very open on online forums about the show and made a pretty lengthy post addressing popular questions about why the show wasn't renewed for a fourth season. Some of the reasons that could have compounded resulting in its non-renewal was lousy ratings, not a lot of Disney shelf space, limited money, time and resources that couldn't just 
justify the quality of animation and production that the show demanded, changes in management, and just in general bad network airing strategies. There was no one particular reason why this show didn't go further than three seasons. It really just was some sort of combination of everything there that attributed to Disney pulling the plug. It did, however, branch out into quite a few Gargoyles comics in the mid-2000s, with both SLG and Marvel. There is even a spin-off comic series titled Gargoyles Bad Guys, which focuses on five villains from the Gargoyles universe. And continuity-wise, anything that Weissman has attached himself to in the comic field since is canon for Gargoyles, and anything that was written and produced without him with the same name is considered not canon. Weissman has specified that if the series were to ever be seen again, whether in spin-off television content or picking up where it left off, it would be up to Disney and Disney alone. Given that Marvel has taken some liberties with producing the comics and that Disney owns Marvel now as well, it's very understandable to assume that they would never sell their creative license to anyone else to make more Gargoyles content. But he has recommended using the old revival tactic of keeping the fandom flame alive and letting Disney know it's something that the viewers would like to see, and that it would be a financially viable investment. Wiseman said to himself, I've always wanted to do more. I've got a timeline for this show that's 315 pages long. I've got notebooks and comp books full of ideas for it, spin-off notions, and all sorts of things. Literally nothing would make me happier than to go back and do more gargoyles. So it's obvious he's on board to further his vision, it's just up to Disney. Since the series started, there has been a few games produced. No, a Gargoyles Quest on the Game Boy has no relation. In 1994, Gargoyles Stone Warriors Battle Card game was released. This was followed by a Sega Genesis game simply titled Gargoyles. And funny enough, while making this video, they recently just announced at Disney's D23 Expo that this Gargoyles game is getting remastered for consoles and PC. I couldn't ask for better timing on this. Maybe I cover it on my gaming channel. Jordan French Gaming, go subscribe. And a much lesser known handheld LCD game called Gargoyles Night Flight being released in 1995. A board game titled Gargoyles Awakening was released in August of 2021, but has received some pretty negative reviews overall. Given that there is still merchandise and games being produced and released to this day, over 20 years since the series premiered its last episode, there's clearly still a lot of fan interest in this series concept, world, and characters. Oh, and Disney would eventually dive into merch even though the show never focused on trying to sell you a toy. But hey, Disney will. But what about you? Is more Gargoyles content something you would like to see in the future? Let me know all that and your thoughts on the series in general down in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this or I'll turn to stone and I won't make content ever again. Click the join button to become a member and support the channel. Follow me on Twitter and I'll be back with another video soon. But until then, later.